Welcome to As the Story Grows. I'm Brian Patton. Today we welcome Robin Stapps, guitarist and songwriter for The Ocean. The Ocean released Holocene on May 19th through Pelagic Records, which Robin also runs. Robin talks about what led him to Berlin, The Ocean's musical evolution, his approach to writing lyrics, how the creative process on Holocene differed from previous records, and more. I listened to Holocene again on my run this morning, and I absolutely love this album. Make sure you click on one of the links in the show notes to give this album a spin, and enjoy today's chat with Robin Stapps from the Ocean. How you doing today? Good, good. Um, yeah, nice. busy day at the Pelagic Warehouse, and now having my <laughs> first evening beer to uh, <laughs> to celebrate nice. the uh, first wave of pre-orders leaving nice. the warehouse today. Nice, nice. How's life been in Germany these past few years? Things are uh, finally relatively back to normal, or yeah, pretty much. I mean, yeah, this year for sure. Yeah, back to normal, full speed. Lots of gigs, too many actually. <laughs> so uh, turnouts have been affected somehow. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, everything's kind of back to normal. Nice, nice. Are you uh, still in Berlin? Is that where you grew up? I am. I am. I did not grow up here, but I've been living here for over twenty years, okay. so it feels like home. Nice. And um, no, I grew up in the in the west, some three hours west of Berlin, and moved here when I was like eighteen, nineteen. Right. So um, yeah, it's it's my base, and it it does feel like home now. Nice, nice. I went to Berlin in twenty eleven with a group. Oh, of wow. artists. Yeah, with the group of artists, and yeah, it was it was awesome. I loved it over there. Right on. How long yeah. did you stay? We were there just over a week. Just over a week. So we went over. Some friends of mine, uh, they opened a cof- uh, like cafe over there, uh, Pro- Prockwurst. Um, uh-huh. So, yeah, we were over there before they opened up trying to do, like, some art stuff with them. as like, a pop-up. So, right. yeah. So it was, it was a lot of fun. 2011 was a good time. Yeah. yeah. I remember yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was, uh, what was growing up like? Um, well, I grew up in a, grew up in a small town in the west of Germany. Um, like I said, three hours west of Berlin, very small town, 5,000 people, lots of forests, absolutely nothing going on. So (laughs) it was nice as a, as a kid and it was incredibly boring as a teenager. (laughs) And, um, now it's nice again. (laughs) Now, now I enjoy (laughs) visiting my parents. Like I just got back from the last weekend actually. And like, it's really nice when you're living in a big city, then you know just going to the countryside for a couple of days to really and they really live like on the outskirts of the village like mm-hmm. so after their garden is just forest basically for 30 kilometers so it's really nice the air is clean and i, I really like going there especially in spring and summer but i did not want to live there and yeah. I, I still <laughs> don't want to live there and um yeah it's a uh, it's <laughs> It's a place to escape from, and now I'm enjoying coming back to it for a couple of days, you know? Yeah, yeah. Nice nice to visit, not to live. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. What got you into music? Um, I think my dad takes credit in that. Um, he um, is a very talented uh, freestyle piano player like he he was very much into jazz when he grew up and played in a jazz band and was very passionate about music and he's kind of virtuous in a way that he can play everything he hears instantly he doesn't know how to read sheet music and um i would say like what he does is is kind of like limited in the you know within it's his own spectrum but he's he's very good at 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 that and like so we had a we had a a, a big concert piano in in our house when i was growing up and he um, also taught me some basics of how to play it. Although back then it didn't really click with me as much yeah. as it should have. <laughs> and then there was a horrible detour when I went to, yeah, check this out. I went to flute classes. <laughs> 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 that was a genius idea of my parents that uh, 
should uh, bring me closer to music that didn't really work out. I hated it so much that I had to get myself evicted from class oh, man. Uh, force, forcefully um, because they just didn't understand that this was not for me. <laughs> so there were some detours, but generally, um, yeah, my old man got me in, you know, into, into music and um, also gave me my first guitar when I was 11 or something. And then somehow I discovered Guns N' Roses and that was the beginning of the end. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Did you want to play guitar? Or was that kind of like, okay, flute didn't work out. Here's guitar. <laughs> yeah. It was more like that. It's not that I had dreams of uh, guitars and that I really wanted that. It was really like, a, like my dad gave me a guitar and I was like, okay, what's this? <laughs> okay. This, this is cool. And then I started, um, yeah, I, I started figuring out a couple things by myself and I had, um, <laughs> I actually had a teacher for a while who was into heavy metal and yeah. i really hated heavy metal back then <laughs> because i was listening to guns and roses and yeah. he was into maiden and it didn't like we didn't click at all yeah <laughs> and, um, i asked him to teach me things that um he didn't really I, th I think he knew how to play them but he didn't really want to so like that was the yeah again like lots of detours but in the end i just um i started sitting down just trying to figure out things by ear yeah and things that i actually liked and I think that um, that really worked and like it, it was obviously difficult in the beginning but once you get to the point where you can kind of figure out whatever it is that you're hearing um, then I think you you've, you're winning the game you know yeah. then, then music starts becoming really fun because then you can take it to the next level and do your own shit but you need to first be able to do that I think right yeah yeah what was the once you started playing and figuring things out like uh, were there people that you could start a band with or was it like you needed to escape and get to berlin <laughs> no like in the i mean it was yeah in the small town environment of course i had friends and we started playing in bands together but it was a little later actually um so when i was when i really got into music first I wasn't good enough to play in a band for a long time. Like uh, I wasn't slash, you know, so it took me some time to acquire some basic skills before I could really enjoy playing in bands. And by that time I had art, like so much water went down the river. In the meantime, I had discovered um, there was rage against the machine. There was Nirvana. There was all the like nineties first wave of what they called mm -hmm. crossover back then happening. There was helmet. There was, um, the Judgment Night, Sembler, where all these hip hop artists collaborated with metal bands, and like you know everything, uh, like was happening in a very short time. And in the meantime, I was trying to figure out what to do with this instrument. And then by the time I was um, good enough to play some riffs, I had discovered hardcore. Yeah. It was like '92 or something like that. Um, when I went to see my first hardcore show, which was Sick of It All in um, in Hamburg, and that was the time when I started playing with people where it wasn't just like total like uncoordinated noise but actually yeah. kids playing some recognizable uh songs and like we, we were covering our favorite bands back then and uh so that, that yeah my first my first bands were like old school hardcore cover bands where we played like yeah like sick of it all songs and nice. we love it kids tracks and things like that you know and that was like probably 90 90 for something like that 93 94 i would say nice what was the metal and hardcore scene like back then in germany well it was I, I, it was thriving okay. um but again i was from a small town so there was there was shit happening where i was from so <laughs> we always had to drive for at least almost like an hour to get to a place where there were shows happening and at the same time we were like 14 15 so we none of us had driver's licenses so we always relied on the like older and, and cooler kits yeah to give us a ride which uh, was hit and missed because they were older and cooler than we were so it was difficult and um there were things happening in in the towns nearby but like where i'm from it was really like a like a desert it was like just nothing happening but um it was a town called salzgitter which was an hour away and they had a, a like a youth center youth club where there were lots of gigs happening and i saw bands there like um all all the way from 93 um until 98 99 i saw bands there like refused and breach and abinanda from the swedish uh, you know like hardcore scene back then but also a lot of american bands like 
Ignite and Strife and um, Unbroken I saw there and Battery right. and bands like that, you know. And um, so we were we were going there often by train or if we had a ride, then uh, the problem was how to get back. But I ended up making friends <laughs> there with people who you know, where we could stay with. And so, like, yeah, things weren't happening in my town, but we had places to go to. And generally, those shows were good. There was good turnouts. It was always a couple hundred kids. And um, it's very shabby. Um, shitty youth clubs with no <laughs> lighting and but like back then we didn't have a sense for that right, you know, right. where like sound or lighting was all like completely unimportant it was all about the the energy and 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 the message and you know just the the raw energy was what really drew me to hardcore like the combination of a positive message with paired with aggressive music somehow mm -hmm. in a way that was very exciting for me you know and I, I i love that and get very involved and started uh running my own fanzine and uh, then i went to the states for a year and started booking shows there and um yeah so it, it all started shaping up during during those years yeah yeah there was a real like urgency back then and because it was all like youth halls and church basements or things at least church basements here in the states like mm. you're like we could do this like it's small and ours and not this big thing that you know, like seems unattainable on MTV. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and the, what I saw in the States was very different from Europe, um, but also very cool. Like you had all these house shows there. Yeah. Like I, I stayed for a year in Florida. I think it was 96. And um, I, I was living in Jacksonville, which was a total shithole. Yeah, um, <laughs> it still is. <laughs> surfers, it still is, yeah. <laughs> any <laughs> place for surfers and there was like there was no scene there and i was so disappointed when i got there but uh <laughs> making friends in gainesville and orlando mm -hmm. and gainesville was a cool place back then yeah. and there were all these like i was going there every weekend and there was all these house shows and bands were playing on the floor in someone's living room and that was awesome that we didn't have in europe in europe everything was very organized in like uh youth clubs you know that were kind of like operated by the government but that were providing this kind of free zone for people to you know take things into their hands and organize shows and, and arts events and that was really cool yeah what led you to uh berlin being fed up with where i came from <laughs> where i grew up and where i spent my childhood and also just the lure of um going to a, a big city like one of the problems we always had was that like we, okay so like i started playing in bands and like it was very limited what we could do there simply because there weren't a whole lot of people that were into this type of music so we were always we never found a bass player for example you know <laughs> i had a really good drummer i played with who's still a friend of mine but we never found a bass player and then it was very difficult to find people that were into the same stuff and i wanted to be in a in an environment where i thought it would be easier to find people like like-minded people that mm -hmm. um you know that i could uh, throw my my visions at and like play music with and do things with and um berlin was relatively close i had been a number of times already just visiting on school trips or things like that and somehow that city had a a lore of like like you didn't really know what was happening it was huge but at the same time very um very much like a village itself you know in, in that there's no like city center and then um like s surroundings or something like that it was very decentralized which was cool because there were different parts of town that all had their own identity yeah and like each one was very different and very distinct but all together it was just like this place where i thought okay th this is where i'm gonna find what i'm looking for and yeah. that's what made me move in the end yeah How'd the ocean get started? So I moved to Berlin with an idea of what I wanted to do musically, but it was very undeveloped still. Um, and um, I started looking for people and I started 
So I went to university. I met some people there. I also started going to shows, of course. I was like handing out flyers at shows um, that I was looking to start a band with certain reference bands named on the flyer, you know, and looking for a vocalist or looking for a guitar player or whatever. And I ended up rehearsing with people and um, most importantly, finding a space uh, first where we could like gather and, and, and play. And then, um, then things just started happening. And I, I like, yeah, I started rehearsing with different people, meeting people at shows. And um, in the beginning, everything was very, um, very chaotic and, and unorganized. We didn't have a fixed lineup for a long time. We just had, it was more like a collective, uh, which is why we called it the collective as well of like open, um, open door, revolving door policy, like people coming, you know, for a rehearsal, but you couldn't really rely on that. And sometimes we had like four <laughs> guitar players, then one day there would be no one. And like, it was just a group of people trying to do something, you know, and for quite a while it was like that. And then, um, it started kind of shaping into something more, um, reliable, uh, in 2003, when we recorded Fog Diver, our, our first album or EP yeah. or whatever, um, that was like the first kind of serious effort after a, a chaotic uh, mess of months of just like jamming and playing with different people. Yeah. Yeah. Where'd the name come from? Um, a Breach song titled Gia. I was a massive Breach fan ever since um i think the first time i saw them was in 94 95 when they were this new school hardcore band from umeo or luleo sweden and then they transformed into this very different band that was playing with two drummers and everyone was dressed in black and like <laughs> it was very like very heavy and negative and lo lots of dissonant guitar work but very like in an incredible band like i can yeah. still listen to any of their records and you know like they haven't they have aged very well and so they have a track uh, titled gia and it's 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 kind of a love song <laughs> <laughs> involving lots of ocean metaphor and uh, i think i took it originally from that track but also i've always been um intrigued by the ocean and, and the sea i uh, spent a lot of time in my uh, childhood and my teenage years close to the sea although i was never living there and i nearly drowned when i was a kid um so i also had a lot of respect for the ocean and it kind of made sense with the music i was writing like which was kind of which i imagined to be like kind of big and epic and uh, you know like um yeah which it wasn't back then because it sounded like shit <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> we didn't have the means to make it sound like we wanted it to sound but you know the idea was there <laughs> so yeah it, yeah it made sense somehow yeah what led you guys to metal blade records um they what we sent out i think what happened was that we released um fog diver in 2003 hmm. instrumental record and then I start immediately after that, I started working on Fluxion and Aeolian. And those two records were kind of recorded in the same session in 2004, end of 2004, early 2005. And the first half of that session became Fluxion, which was released on a small German label back then. And at the same time, I started sending out those demos to a bunch of labels. And um, among those demos was the second album which was aeolian basically and metal blade replied to that andreas reisnauer from the german office really loved it hmm. um i think he was an old neurosis fan and he was doing some a and r for them back at that time and i think it took him some convincing work to get um to get the rest of the metal blade team to agree but <laughs> he was he, he supported us very strongly he really loved it and uh in the end we got an offer in i think 2005 yeah uh, for Aeolian and a multiple album deal. And back then that, that was like a super big thing for us because we, yeah, we, we had worked with a couple of smaller German labels that, um, got us 
good results in Germany. Like people knew who we were in the scene, but like nowhere outside of Germany and touring was very difficult. And uh, obviously having a label of that size and scope behind you was a, was a big deal. So we were very happy. When you approach an album and you're approaching like songs and, and especially lyrics, you seem very like there's a theme and everything is crafted and you have a message. Like what led you to that style of writing? I think that's something that um, comes out of the process of how I write lyrics, mm. um, which is always the last part of the creative process for me. So I, I always like I've always been writing um, songs as instrumentals and then um, starting to think about vocals. And when you have vocals, you need lyrics. <laughs> and then when I start writing lyrics, I like to have a, like just a theme or like a framework, like something that gives me a bit of direction, mm -hmm. you know, so that um, I can kind of like cling on to that. And also at the same time, go deeper and really explore something. And um, for me, that's, always been quite important to to be productive and um i was studying philosophy at that time for I, yeah for like six or seven years i actually have a master in philosophy so i was always there was always mingling with uh, being creative in terms of music and writing songs so i mm -hmm. there, there were always like lots of things that i was thinking about in my uh, daily life and you know caused by my studies basically that i was then in the beginning, I think subconsciously revisiting when I was writing lyrics because those were yeah. the things that were on, on on my mind somehow, you know. And um, so that's how it started to have records that um, that follow a certain topic or a, a certain thread. Yeah, I was wondering if like philosophy played a role, especially in like heliocentric. And oh yeah, of yeah. course. Like in, on all of our records, I mean, it's. it's it's a lot of personal stuff mixed with a lot of great ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, the centric records, particularly, um, that was a record I, I've been wanting to make for, for a long time. Uh, we recorded it in 2009, but it's an idea I've had since I think 2004, 2005 to make yeah. a, like a record about uh, the, the legacy of Christianity and, and, um, like from a historic perspective, but also from, you know, anthropocentric is, is approaching it more in, in terms of, uh, yeah, contrasting very, very conservative uh, religious doctrines and views with uh, Dawkins and, and, you know, Darwin's findings yeah. and Galilei and Copernicus on, on the centric records. That was made for being a concept album. Like, I, yeah. I, I, I knew that. And there's like so much, like, once you start thinking about that, there's so, you can make like four records about that, you know, and so that was actually a, an album where writing the lyrics was very, I, I won't say easy because it's always a struggle for me because so many things have to fit, but uh, that's a, a, an album where everything made sense. And like, yeah. once you start thinking your way into it, you already have the idea for the next track. And so that was, uh, that, that's what I like about having a, a framework, you know, like you start thinking about something and you just end up with all these possibilities and options to explore, um, other perspectives or other threats and that's yeah that's what makes it really really interesting and and easygoing yeah yeah with this most recent stretch of records talking about like the different time periods of of the earth like has that been a long thing where you knew it was going to take albums to go through this or is it just kind of like a progression no that was something that just happened i mean originally i ended up with the idea to do this kind of like paleontology inspired or earth history inspired yeah. album with precambrian and back then it came from just trying to visualize the the music that i was writing so when i was listening to the pre-productions of precambrian i always saw these prehistoric landscapes and um 
streams of lava and you know like rocks flying through the air and I, like it just felt very appropriate for you know if you wanted to have videos for those songs live visuals or something that yeah. would be what you would have wanted to choose and then i was like okay so maybe um that could be like a, a topic and i have to mention also i was also studying <laughs> geography and geology <laughs> which is weird in combination with philosophy but it, in germany uh, it it made sense it's a different yeah. topic but anyway so like i was exposed to that like whole realm of thinking as well and like again this is something where that clashed with the, the music i was writing and the, the art i was into yeah yeah that's cool what would you credit the shift in sound over the years to just like becoming better players different members or like an intentional like we want to go more prog or whatever <laughs> like oh definitely no intentional we want to go more prog um <laughs> like different players yes for sure a lot of, there have been a lot of people in and out of the band over the years which is um probably partially due to the fact that I'm an unbearable person and partially <laughs> due to the fact that people start having families, growing right. older, wanting to work career jobs or whatever. So, I mean, the band is 23 years old, you know, so naturally yeah. there have been quite a lot of different people in and out of the band and everyone brought their own um, inspiration and desires and taste with it and kind of like shaped the band in that way. Although I was writing the music most of the time. So that was definitely important and um on the other hand also experimenting with things and realizing something that, that's the beauty of experimenting like you you try things and eventually you get to this point where something makes sense you know and no. you're like oh this is actually really cool and then you start exploring that and developing that and that is always something that is not really planned for um but that can have a great impact on what you what you do, what you want to do in the future. So, yeah, so it's that, it's the different people in the lineup and then also just growing up as a person and a musician and, um, and uh, the, the changes and development that comes with that, you know, like w when I wrote Aeolian, I think the, the type of songs I wanted to write that was very different from the type of songs I want to write now. Like I, I can still enjoy a track like city in the sea, the opener of Aeolian. And we've just discussed playing that live again. You yeah. know, it's a super heavy track, very complicated arrangements. And yeah. you have to learn it. You're like, what the fuck? Like why? <laughs> you know, it's so counterintuitive. And it's, <laughs> and that's just like me sitting there and thinking I'm going to make this really fucking hard, you know, yeah. for anyone to understand. And like, even for myself, and that is just not the thing I find challenging now when I write music. So a lot, there's a lot of water that went down the river and I've changed as a person and, yeah. and as a writer as well. And so, yeah, every, like all these records have a kind of like a time stamp, you know, and you can clearly tell that and hear that. And it's, I think that's normal. Yeah. Yeah. Because the band has been around for two decades and there's been so many members. Has there ever been a moment where you're just like, fuck it, I'm done. <laughs> Um, surprisingly, not really. I think I, I, no, I haven't, I haven't gotten sick of playing music or playing in this band. I mean, there have been many frustrating moments with individuals where I was like, very frustrated and but it was <laughs> really not like I'm done. I'm like, you're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to deal with this shit anymore but yeah. no, I never lost my interest to, to play music or to tour or to make records for, for me that's still the greatest shit in the world like yeah. everything that comes with it from the touring to the making records yeah. to everything in between and um, if, if I ever get to that point I'm, I'm yeah I'm, I'm not going to force it you know I, I don't have to but right now this is what I decided to do with my life and i have absolutely no regrets it's it's, nice. it's an incredible privilege to be able to tour and, and travel and get to see places um, not from through the eyes of a tourist but through the eyes of a touring musician hanging out with locals and and um and being paid to perform music it's fucking beautiful so, yeah yeah nice nice how did uh COVID affect the band so we had a very busy year 2019 um 
touring like all over the place. We started the year in in, uh, in India in January, then we went to Australia and New Zealand, then we had a European tour, then festivals, then we had another European tour, and we've basically been out the whole year. So when the pandemic hit in early 2020, we were all quite tired from touring and happy to be <laughs> home for a while. So, yeah. um, it was, I think for everyone, it was like, kind of like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> 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 Finally, some time to chill. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And, and then, so for a couple of months, it was, I, I think every band member would have to answer that individually. Also sure. you know, for, for me personally, um, I met my, uh, now girlfriend in, um, like around that time also and she kind of got stuck with me she's from another country and couldn't go home and <laughs> that was a very fortunate situation because we really clicked and got along and it was just a nice time that we spent the two of us being at home and you know cooking good food and having a great time yeah um that's maybe not the same for for everyone in the band i think everybody dealt with it very differently but generally we were happy to take a bit of a break for a while and then six months later in like in the fall of 2020 it started getting really boring <laughs> which is when peter and me started writing holocene yeah and i wrote a, another record a second record that we haven't even started recording yet oh, just wow. reproductions around the same time so um we used that time for for writing and that is something that you normally don't have the time for when you're touring a lot so it was, it was also good it was still working out very very well and then in early 2021 it was getting very frustrating because we, we hadn't also seen each other in a long time and there was no shows going on and nobody could see an end and then we did these two live streams um we just felt like we have to do something to feel alive and to you know stay together and to meet and just interact and so we uh, got together in the middle of lockdown and started rehearsing for these two live streams we did one for fenrozoic one um and one for Roadburn Redux for the digital version of Roadburn that we filmed in March 2021. And that was for us really healthy and important to play music together in a room for a month, pretty much to prepare yeah. for that. Although the streams itself were a super weird experience, playing this massive hall with no audience in it and still knowing that a lot of people are watching, it was really weird. But I think looking back at it now, it was a good experience for all of us to do that. Yeah, and then I like so the band was kind of like struggling to do something, and at the same time the label was very busy. I also run Pelagic Records, mm -hmm. and um, for the label it was the pandemic was very good because it, since people couldn't spend their money on on gigs and uh, and drinks at bars, <laughs> they spent their money on vinyl, and we yeah. saw this massive boom and just had lots of orders. And finally, there was some time for me also to focus on a lot of projects that otherwise I would have never had the time for, you know, because I'm touring. Um, so I, I, I was busy and generally it, it was a, a good time, but of course we all, we were so fucking happy last year yeah. when the first tour we did was the US tour in, um, in March with leprous and at that time europe was still shut down and when we arrived there and all of a sudden there were shows happening no one checking like vac status at the entrance everybody without masks and we were like what the fuck like this it's, <laughs> it seemed like the pandemic never never happened yeah. you know and that was for us at that time we were just so drained by uh, everything was so difficult over here and yeah. that was like very liberating to come to the states and realize okay fuck the world is like it, <laughs> the world as we knew it it's it's still there you know yeah 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 when they decided it was over here they they went full hog <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> sure, yeah 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 what led you guys to release this new record just like independently on your label and not with metal blade was your contract just up or it did yes and um we were in talks with them to uh, potentially renew it but in the end we decided not to um for different reasons um i think we're now in a position where we can do this ourselves with pelagic uh, like i started the label um, 14 years ago and we now have a, a distribution and promotion network that is quite comparable to what they could offer us i think in many ways in most territories in the states we have the same digital and physical distribution for example and in europe uh, in many countries too and some it's intentionally different choices but overall i felt like we can do this ourselves yeah. now obviously the less parties involved the more 
remains for the artist, yeah. which is very important at a time when 90% of your fees will end up in the black hole of a tour bus. You know, everything's gotten mm -hmm. twice as expensive throughout the course of the pandemic. So um, it's also simply a rational choice to say, like, we don't want to give the share away to anyone anymore mm -hmm. when we don't have to. And, um, and yeah, I, I just felt the time was right for this. We've done 250 releases with Pelagic yeah. now since 2000, um, 2009 and um, gained a lot of experience and built up our own network. And so it just felt like the time is right for this. I don't want to say extra time to write, but because you had COVID to write, were there things you wanted to try differently on this record that you'd not done previously? It wasn't really a conscious decision or anything related to COVID. It's just that this record happened in a quite different way than all previous records because it's all ideas that were initially written by Peter, our synth guy, that he sent to me in, in, uh, in late 2020. And... In the beginning, I didn't even know if this was material for the ocean, but I liked it and I wanted mm -hmm. to do things with it. And so I started uh, adding guitars and, and drums and, you know, like doing my things with them and adding parts. And um, we were sending things back and forth. And then by the end of it, we had this album. And then all of a sudden, it very much sounded like an ocean album. Yeah. That vibe, you know, although it's yeah. like uh, more synth driven somehow, but it's it still had that ocean vibe. And so it was like, okay, so here we have a new ocean record. Do we, and, you know, we were like, yeah, yeah I think we do. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it happened, it happened in a quite different way. Cause normally it's, it's, uh, it's always been me doing most of the writing. And here it was me for the first time dealing with songs or like ideas that came from, from the outside, from someone yeah. else. And it was very inspiring to not work with the, an entirely blank page but to have something that you know you need to deal with somehow mm -hmm. and to make that work and for me that was great it's really good nice nice this is the last chapter of the paleontology series were there things you wanted to say lyrically on this record to close it out for sure um first off it wasn't this record wasn't planned to be another um another chapter mm -hmm. like, Anerzoic 2 was supposed to be the closing chapter. Okay. And uh, when Peter sent me those ideas and this record started shaping up, uh, it felt like it was an appendix to Fenrozoic mm -hmm. somehow, you know, exploring mm -hmm. the direction that Fenrozoic 2 had already taken on the second half of that record. And so um, since it connected so well with that, I was like, all right, let's add another chapter. And it made sense to go deeper into the Holocene, which is the last epoch of uh, the geological time scale and the one that we're currently living mm -hmm. in and to go a, a little deeper there and uh, to thematize the, the modern or more like the postmodern age that we live in. So like it's the, it, it was a uh, kind of like an unwanted child, this record, you know, <laughs> it, just, uh, it just happened. Um, and lyrically it was um, also different from all previous records in a way that every song on that record kind of has its own agenda and its own, topic so it's in a way it's the least conceptual record we've done um but uh yeah at the same time all the tracks orbit around the same kind of like feelings and moods mm -hmm. and sentiments that are very much coming out of the pandemic and this weird time that we were all experiencing when we were writing the record you know when the world all of a sudden wasn't the same anymore and mm -hmm. lots of things um that were completely unprecedented happened and nobody knew what was even going on. And I think uh, this general confusion and, and alienation and all that paired with 
horrible uh, conspiracy theories and a general lack of critical thinking in, um, among my close circle of friends that I observed and also in the media was, was very much in, influenced the, uh, the writing of the lyrics of this record. And um, yeah, like I said, it wasn't planned for it, but it was very much a reflection of that, that time that it was born out of. What's uh, the rest of this year look like for the band? We're taking a strategic break right now um, <laughs> for a couple of months um, until summer festivals are starting in July. And then we're going to be touring again in September, October. We have a European co-headliner tour coming up that we're very excited about where we're going to play the Holocene material. And uh, after that, um, we would like to return to the States. Uh, we've done two tours last year. We would really like to do a headline tour um, with a long set. And um, yeah, I, that's the, the project we're currently working on to get the right package together. And I, I start, I'm starting to understand that it's not so easy because, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we want a band that kind of like also fits with the vibe of Holocene somehow, yeah. you know, that we can connect with and uh, that already rules out a lot of bands that we all love and that yeah. would normally work out. But it, it's uh, it's not it's not really a, a, a metal record, you know, yeah. Yeah. and um, it makes it tricky to find the right band to tour with. So we're currently working on that. But yes, we still have Vsauce until mid next year and we absolutely want to return to the stage. Thanks for listening to As the Story Grows. Our intro music was written and composed by Jeremy Hunt. The As the Story Grows theme is by Bob Nana. If you like what you hear, subscribe wherever you get your podcast and give us a rating and review. If you'd like to support the show financially, you can join us at patreon.com slash as the story grows. Be a part of our community and join the ongoing conversation over on Discord. If you enjoy this episode, share it on social media with your friends. Much appreciated, and thanks for listening. I never thought so young and alive.